I just want to welcome everyone to In the Daw. This week we have Fox Stevenson himself. How you doing, man? Hey, hey. Multiplier cannot make it today. He's on a super strict deadline with something or another. And so we got Maverick, also known as Cole Parkey. So let's just let's just hop into the bass sound design, man. Let's check this thing out. The actual lead sound is made up of these two sounds kind of folded together. This is just a sine wave and a square wave, I believe, but on two different instances of serum. Like we started off with the bass sound being, which is the bass sound of the track. It's like there was actually a high note in there that I never um, took out, but for some reason that ended up sounding kind of cool. Um, so there's also... It starts from there. So that's that's the beginning part of the sound. Absolutely. Those two things get distorted together. I think the square is low cut and kind of EQ'd. And then you get... Yeah, I guess you're starting to hear that tone, right? To get that type of tone, so you threw on the Logic's native distortion plugin. Logic's right? native distortion, nothing crazy going on. It's just driven, and then I've taken the gain down. No, when like with no roll off. The thinking behind that is you still get that note up top, but what happens is is because it's folding it into being like you know just completely clipped off. It's having to force those harmonic uh, the the note itself, like the the top line in between the highest points of the sine wave going into it. So you end up getting that kind of growl, that sort of textural thing. Like, you know, you take the you take the distortion off and it's just really sterile. And then you then you distort it and you get what happens is is I rolled off the lowest of the low, like lower than 20 hertz, because OTT likes to do crazy things to the low end and you end up getting weird stuff. I use this thing called Micro Shift, which is by uh, Sound Toys to just widen up the top end. And then I've boosted the low. <laughs> nice and easy. So that thing gets muted. This is actually like bus 10 on uh, Logic. So what happens next is there is serum effects, which I feel like people are undervaluing entirely. The audio is coming in from bus 10 and it's literally just an EQ and a filter that's coming in here. But so we've got this coming into here. Now this on the serum effects channel, we've got um, this MIDI here. This, now this this is where the bulk of the sound comes from, to be honest. All of these here are re-trigger points and also like, you know, it's note data. This MIDI stuff is getting fed into this instance of Serum Effects to trigger this little shark fin looking thing. What that initially does is I've got this set to the gain on a low shelf that goes all the way up and a little bit of gain up top. And what you get... At the moment, all it is is a little bit of EQ moving and some amplitude moving. That's that's the bulk of the sound right there. If I got rid of this data here, I could I could. No, it's, it's literally it's just every time I press a note, it's just doing doing that stuff. That is um, mind blowing. That way you can create a bass, uh, a, a like a, a bass is in B A S E, a, a bass sound like a, f a foundation for something to be completely remodulated in serum effects. Yeah, so you can do whatever you want to that sound at that point. You can treat it like uh, some wavetables with some filtering on them. So the next thing I did, so there's this other piece of modulation here, which you'll see isn't tied to being re-triggered. It's not on envelope like the like the other one is. The way that it's getting so much changing and movement is because the mod wheel is set to the rate of this, uh, this little thing. So as the mod wheel changes, you can get faster and slower ones. So those first ones are really choppy and then the next, yeah, so the first four are quite short. So like those first ones are really choppy and then they come down here and it's all slower. Like, just in terms of the speed. Like, if I was going to do this track again, I'd probably have done this because it would be... You know, you, you can change how fast or slow things are opening up. So that that's uh, all tied to the mod wheel. You could do a lot of other stuff with it, but I, I guess I kept it kind of simple on this one. The next bit takes a little while to get right. This was where, I, where a lot of the hours went into this sound, like reverb filter. Because of... Um, the way, way the resonance on that, sh that stuff works is bringing out loads and loads of low end, which is causing it to distort. The 
thing is, is it's kind of distorting coming out of serum effects. Yeah. That, I didn't know it was doing that until right now. You see on here, on this cutoff, this is moving yeah. to this. It's moving that cutoff. Oh, ten. So it's moving that cutoff on and off like a dirt, 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 like a clock. See how much it changes the tone of the sound when I move that cutoff. I was just wanting to get a kind of like that, that kind of rhythm yeah. in there as well without screwing with the sound too much. One thing that Serum FX allows you to do that using any kind of filter plugin, it allows you to key track a little. So the note down here is the reason this trigger data in here isn't just one note is because this reverb filter is also moving by what note is being played on the trigger data. So it's the same intervals and, and pattern as, as the bass. So as the bass, you know, the, the sine wave that kind of got screwed um, squashed in there with the, the higher noise. As that one moves, so does the resonances and the things of the reverb filter. I'm pretty sure it's not perfect, so it's not moving the frequency of the reverb filter at the same amount as the note is changing. So you end up getting weird incongruencies and then each note sounds a little different. This, yeah, because that one kind of has a different tone to the rest of them. It's A lot of it is happy accidents and a lot of it is like, oh, that sounds good. I need to hold on to that whilst also changing all these other parameters around it. And of course, you're going to lose stuff as you're doing all those sure. sort of things. And I guess it's, it's a bit of a wrestle getting these sounds to pop. In theory, you could get rid of the note data like, and it would sound like this. And it's still interesting, but it doesn't have that movement anymore. Or at least to me, it doesn't sound as interesting or as fun, I guess. Right, so the next thing was just like um, expanding gates, I think. Yeah, getting rid of those lowest points a bit. Probably too many EQs, I'll admit to that. These basically aren't doing much at all. Like with a sound like this, and once you start putting things on top, you don't want to bypass the earlier things in case that there's one small thing you're doing that has rippling effects all the way through the all the way through the chain. Like this was the first time I'd done this sound, so I was kind of a little afraid of it, a little afraid to do anything more than what was there or, yeah. or to kind of take too many steps back because we had something cool. This is just going to be squashing the low end so it's safe. Yeah. So now everything's kind of glued up, feeling good. Um, in terms of settings, that's just a really hard, really hard um, compressing, fast attack, crazy ratio, fast release, threshold is actually not that low, but probably because it's so such a loud sound coming out of Serum anyway. Most of the work's been done. Like the sound's fine. The reverb filter is particularly wide and ecstatic on the on the stereo field. I took out all the 12 dB of the stereo from 200 and below just because you don't want too much stereo information there. But I left a little in there because I like the idea of there being a little bit of kind of wobble going on there and gained it down because it's really loud noise. <laughs> Okay, at this point, I'm starting to like warm it and get so from about 300 to 1.6, 1.7. I'm doing some pretty heavy tube distortion and then re-EQing. I'm thinking about making it really soft somehow, but I guess at some point I thought this is what I need. <laughs> um, I'm not sure why I made that decision looking at it right now. There's a dimension expander on here that's pretty gratuitous. It's, it's going to be quite a long one. The reason behind that is, like for a long time, a, a lot of my productions were about all these elements kind of flying around and stuff. I realized that it's a lot of fun just trying to make one sound completely over the top, taking over the entire mix. And so you have to make that thing sound huge. And, and I don't mean like euphemistic sense or like, you know, kind of symbolic, like huge, or when you say something's crunchy, I mean, you have to make it sound like it's a large object in a large space. Mm -hmm. The moment that goes away, you realize how much of a big step you've taken in making something accentuated, larger and important. Important's a really good word, I think, for that. You make it step forward in, in front of anything else by making it sound like the biggest thing in the track. To be honest, that sounds Ah! That sound is, um, <laughs> that, that sounds kind of cool on its own. That's one thing I would say is, is people seem to be kind of afraid of volume automating things. Like yeah. volume automation sounds amazing. Like it, <laughs> it can sound really cool if you've got a good sound bass, B-A-S-E, bass yeah. sound. <laughs> nice. What was that? No problem. Nothing. I, I'm not expecting anyone. <laughs> if it's a pack, I'm not expecting packages. So then I'm taking out stuff out the low end uh, stereo wise doing that okay so here's here's the big thing with, with the dimension expander so this is it before the dimension expander and the dimension expander adds and it makes it 
fill this giant cacophonous place. Like it's it's about signposting. Making a track is about signposting things to the listener in in, in a sort of like this sound is big. It is important. This sound is loud. It is also important. This is soft and not very aggressive. It's it's not. And I guess those those decisions. Even though a lot of people will make them naturally, you can you can kind of reverse engineer them and think this sound needs to be really important. Yeah. I should do these things to it. So all that really went into it after that is getting rid of the low end from the dimension expander with a with another shelf in the stereo. So it's, so it's all just at the top, moving around. That's the sound itself. Mostly, I do have a backup sound that kind of helps it. That's where a little of the vowel sound is coming from. Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty sure I can guess ahead of time that this is the same sound with low pass or yeah, LBH. So this starts from the same place and then it's an LBH filter following a slightly different kind of curve and um, a phaser. Little cool trick for phasers is if you take the rate down to zero and then modulate the frequency, you can actually um, do some really cool stuff like that, then that's a really good thing to like um, stack up with filters and stuff because you can double up on a vowel sound. And then when you get two things that are kind of like skating past each other in terms of resonances, you get more of a almost vocal quality. To it. Yeah, it sounds sounds a little bit more vocal, I guess. Um, and after that, that's the, that's I'm gating it again. This time, more aggressively, distorting it again, putting. Um, Making it really stereo, actually. Yeah. Like 50% mix of, of like that, which is you know, very far apart. Then EQs, stupid app. A lot of these EQs are terrible. A little, actually, a little tip that I came across recently or, or I kind of did for myself recently and has done a lot for me is if you're using like something like ProQ2, set your default your default like size to maybe 12 or 6. You'll find that it's going to force you to make much smaller EQ decisions. Let's say I added like, you know, this here, some 2K and you're boosting it, you might do this like naturally to a certain, certain amount where you've made a difference. If you're doing it in 30, that's nothing. You're not going to make that kind of push as naturally. You'll feel like you're not doing as much work. You know, you'll have gone to there. Whereas if you go down to 12, this is like, you'll naturally find yourself making more subtle decisions. And that that's, that's often good. Like the less you have to do to a sound, even though this is going to be completely hypocritical with how much stuff we've laid on top of this thing, the less you have to do with the sound, the better it's going to be, the more pure it's going to be. So we don't want we don't want the two low ends of the sounds interfering so this thing's cut at 100. It's nice to have sometimes a little bit of interference going on around 200 because it's a weird area. You don't want too much of it in general anyway, but a little bit of strangeness in between those snare hits is always always nice. Gain reduction. Yo, I've seen this before. You're the only other person I've ever seen use this. Now we burn every track. Now we burn every track. Perfect aggressive compression with zero effort is absolutely amazing. Do you like that? I love it. And the reason I love it is because I like OTT a little bit when it's right, but it has such a tone with it. It gives you a very particular sound and a particular kind of scoopy thing that goes on. Yeah, you can change the gains on the bands, but at the end of the day, OTT sounds like OTT. Mm. Gain reduction sounds like the sound you put into it, but big. (laughs) This thing is on 50% mix and it does. It just, it's louder, so it's going to trick you into thinking it's better, but those lower points are so much louder without any kind of tone shaping that it's it's more convincing. There's, there's other sounds in the, in the track that I gain reduced as well. Like if you put it on something with a reverb tail, the reverb tail is going to be a, as loud as the sound. Like even if there's a big difference between the pluck itself or something and then the reverb tail, it's just going to even those out. So that pluck's going to be really dry and the tail's going to be really wet. And that's a really nice sound. And then of course, Dimension Expander. Probably not as much because I don't want this sound to be as important as the other one. So the way the bass changes in that next section to... Cole does have to head out. See you guys. Have fun. Talk to you later, man. Later. So it ch- changes to this. It changes to that after all that is, is if we kind of reverse engineer and go all the way back, taking the higher one that we kind of crushed in there with it and making an octave lower. We take that back up an octave. What, what way you choose to reveal those notes is a, is a really kind of cool and important part of a sound like this. So... Phone zombie drum mix that's beautiful <laughs> yeah so this is a track i was working on recently so that, that so your next question was about the the drums right yep, at the beginning yep. they sound like this in isolation 
And did you did you drum this? They are they are real drums. I didn't drum them. This is actually part of a project I've been working on recently that involves a lot of real instruments. That's not going to see the light of day just yet, and it's a bit under wrapsy in, in nature. But um, I'm I'm free to talk about the process of how the drums were made. Nice. And whatever. This is from a track called Phone Zombie, with which uh, to be honest, I don't love this drum mix as much anymore. But um, it's from a track that's at like one one twenty eight. Like uh, I think the drums were taken from this section to make sure you never have the same hit hit twice. So. So yeah, it's, it's, it's um, pitched up a little, it's like, um, you know, sped up. Yeah, I think what's what's cool is that none of those hits are happening twice. They're all like an individual different hit of the same drum, but they're not exactly the same. I, I, I'm a bit of a sucker for that, like um, natural deviation from the same sound. It's human, it's amazing. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really, really into that. And I try and replicate that in any situation possible. Each kick drum well actually any any hit on here is not you didn't go in you slice it out and then duplicate it over right it's all this is a one take of this guy actually drumming right yeah so i'll have grabbed like that kick then another kick then another kick then another kick then another kick and then those will have been when i need a kick i would go across the list and make sure that if i needed a kick it wasn't one of the ones i used before to be honest you know that's not that's not a big feature of the of the of the sound of those drums the big feature is that it's it, it's real drums oh and there's also, there's also this little thing, I think. Well, that's cute. <laughs> yeah, which is just some stereo saws, pretty much. Nice. Oh, and this thing has its fundamental cut out so that it wouldn't um, interfere with the sub bass. Do you do that with most of your, you know, if, if you're doing something in Serum and that is not necessarily supposed to be sub heavy, do you always go and cut out the fundamental? I think it's nicer to do that. And yeah, I, I do mostly if I'm not going to be riding into a distortion because th and that's why I didn't cut it out of this one until later on. If, if it's not riding into a distortion, it's nice to do that because you don't necessarily have to cut Hmm. which creates resonances, things of that nature. You can just like shelf or you can leave it completely bare. So yeah. like bare so that it's just not touching the sub and everything else is everything else is Gucci. Did you just barely release a new song? Yeah, Bulgogi. That one's actually been uh, um, been done for a while. Yeah, it's a fun house thing. I'm, I'm really proud of, of the bass line on that one. That was just me fooling around making some bouncy, housey stuff. And then I guess playing around with that whole Jack Hewish kind of sound in the, in the middle of it. Kind of an innocuous one. Nothing, there was no real goal intended for that track when making it. It was like put these things together, see what happens. Oh, I kicked my hard drive off. Does that happen often? That happen. I would go over the sound of those drums in particular, like uh, those, those acoustic ones, but Mixing acoustic drums is a whole talk on its own. Oh. I was ripping my hair out, like completely trying to work out how people get those mics to sound, you know, like yeah. big and things. And luckily I got really ill. I holed up in bed for a few, for a few days and I uh, just watched all the experts I could um, talking about how, how they mix drums. And I tried to ignore everything they said about what they did and tried to listen mostly to why they did it. Why you make decisions I think is, 80% and this sort of thing. Yeah. It's 80% of, of, of it. Someone recently told me to Google like Fox Stevenson remake on YouTube and there's people talking about how, how they've made a remake of my track. And I mm. think I've got my camera working again. Anybody is seeing of me doing these things today. Try not to copy exactly what I do because it won't help you. You're welcome to. And if you get results, then, then awesome. Try and think about why it would be that I would want to fold those two sounds together at the very beginning of that thing, as opposed to just leaving them as they are. And for me, the answer is that I want to get there to be a relationship between the bass and the me melody so that they almost become the same thing. And then eventually, you know, you'll hear that as a bass sound, but it's also like the sub is going dun, 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 dun. And the, and the um, melody on top is going na, 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 na. And it's like, it's important to me that those things have a relationship. And if it's not to you, don't do that. Because if someone just goes and copies you, it's very superficial. It's it's the smoke to the fire. It's not the fire. Fire is why you do it. Yeah, every, every decision you make needs to be because if you think something sounds cool and, and someone's doing it because they're making a sound that sounds cool to you, then try work out why, why that sound sounds cool to you and just focus on that thing and then plant that seed and grow your own tree and you'll have your own your own track sounds in, in no time. Like I'm, I'm just scrolling idly. I need to just yeah, search yeah. it. <laughs> idly scrolling. Um, yeah, here we are. So what I think I ended up doing in this this version of the project, so what, what, I, um, what I will have done is I'll have exported out all the pieces that made up that other drop a minute ago and any of the intro things 
into this as individual um, audio files because I find, especially as a Logic user, I, I don't know if this is as great in Ableton. I know a lot of the people who um, export their things and redo their mix downs, they tend to move to something like Cubase or Logic that's a much more mixery mm, DAW. But yeah, I've, I'll, I will have exported everything out. I actually think I exported the bass sound out dry. Very dry. So I think I got rid of everything but, yeah, but the, the serum effect. So I kind of redid it and I guess gain reduced it. Yeah, EQ, gain reduce. Ah, now this, this, okay, so originally the sound before was quite, the high end was a bit scratchy. So using this uh, multiband frequency shifter, what I will have done is made the high end a lot flappier. <laughs> it's the word I would use. So here it was before. See how it kind of wets it up, but without kind of creating anything more on full it would be like and that's, well, that's yeah, just a key saying what's cool about frequency shifters is they're amazing on drums because pitch shifters they they work on the harmonics uh, on the uh, chromatic scale they uh, increase something's pitch across the thing like exponentially mm -hmm. whereas a frequency shifter works linearly so it adds in this case, 75 hertz to absolutely every frequency that, it, that is on it. So, you know, an octave is a double is a double frequency. With this, all you're doing is adding exactly the amount. So it, it, it really changes it. If you did it to a chord or something, it would sound crazy. Is that a native logic thing or is that a third party? This is a third party Melda multiband frequency shifter. Every frequency shifter works like that. And if you were to put it on all like 100% wet. In fact, what I'll do is I'll solo this one. So if I go 100% on this one, listening to it. See how it's not harmonic anymore. Because those lowest ones have had 700 added to them. These ones have had 700 added to them and gone a lot less far because we're used to seeing EQs that are on that um, yeah. exponential scale. So it's like, if you think of a, a G, a G is roughly about like 100, 100 hertz. The next G is 200 hertz. And the next G after that is 400 hertz. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you frequency shift it, by 50, that first G is going to become 150 hertz, and the next one would become 250 hertz. Oh, I see in terms saying. of the harmonic and chroma chromatic scale, they've moved a different amount. So it starts making things really out of tune. But with drums, that doesn't matter. Freaking Fox, man. <laughs> <laughs> what you can do, which is really cool, if I get these drums that we were talking about earlier, you can like, and because it's only adding to frequencies, it's really clean. It doesn't have any weird freak outs like a lot of pitch shifters would. What? Dude, that is so sick. You know, oh you can totally God. shape sounds. And automating those, right? Like changing those over time, that, oh, oh. You could, yeah. I've never done that, but you totally could. I'm actually really bad for using automation. I don't really automate ever. <laughs> that is a great idea, Fox. It's not mine. It's, it's, I know a lot of guys in drum and bass who use it. It's one of those things that a lot of people do to affect breaks or even like full drum sounds. It's really cool. I'm, I think I'm the only guy at the moment doing it on real drum mixes. Like I wouldn't have done it on that one, but there's stuff on that to do with that project where I've done that like two whole drum mixes and, and yeah, it's made yeah, a, a real drummer sound really weird and electronic. It's kind of cool. If you think about the way that the snares hit, if you're frequency shifting something down, the oscillations are going to be the same length in time. If it's a lower sound, there's going to be less of those oscillations. So it's going to sound really tight. Or if you're doing it up, if you're doing it with the snare on this thing, if you're doing it with the snare frequency on this thing, um, It doesn't sound as tight. Yeah, it, it just sounds higher. Or lower, it's like. To make this thing bigger, I ended up putting like a little echo on it. That's not doing a lot, it's doing just. Just that little bit. Little bit, the dimension expanders back. Hey. The same cut, except this time I actually cut it this time. All right. Surfer EQ, is this doing anything? Whoa. Yes, it is. 
so to make room for my snare, often I won't side chain the low end with my snare because of th this sort of thing. If you're cutting out the 200 sort of zone from a bass, it, it, it can leave a lot of room for everything else without actually damaging the overall feel for, for um, something, unless it's a really warm sound. This Surfer EQ reads the fundamental of a sound like, so in this one, it's going to read the lowest, the lowest note, um, and it moves based on where that is. So it's like a pitch tracking EQ base. It can freak out sometimes, but that could be cool too. On this, all it's doing is it's following that sub sound and it's getting rid of the next couple of harmonics. So you've got this kind of valley between the sub and the mid sounds. And those that in that place, you can fit a lot of drum reverb, um, which can make the drums sound really cool, like roomy drum reverb. Here. Oh, freak, freaked out, AC. <laughs> oh, yeah. If I get that back, you get this kind of See that, that kind of warm warmth it gets? That's, that can be really nice and, and can be really useful, but it ended up not being in this track. I got rid of it. Like, what you can also do with this EQ is you can create like really, really, really like sharp stuff. Then it's all just like EQs, a very low mix gain reduction to kind of get that those tails popping. I get rid of that? That's a lot less mental, I guess. And that's, yeah, that's that's the sound in its actual form. You want to do vocals? I yeah, totally yeah. sidetracked it. This no, is what I do. Good. Touchdown, midnight, pull back till I get it right. I miss you, don't care. <laughs> a quick look, side eye. Tilt as you go by, miss you, but don't care. There's a lot of That's just like an exported little vocoder. Uh -huh. I remember being really proud of that because it, it really adds to the build up, even though it's right at the end there. Uh -huh. The vocal itself, the way I like to think about things when I'm doing a vocal is that there has to be a lead lead. That thing stands up front, unless, unless you're going for a really crowdy vocal. And I'm assuming that's this one. Touchdown! It is. So dry sounds like this. Touchdown! Midnight! So I'm lucky in that I've got a really cool mic, which is an Aston Spirit. These things are actually really cheap for how amazing they are. They're bomb proof, like drop proof. They look really cool. And some really cool input e hardware. Like I've got what's called a Warm Audio Tone Beast and a Warm Audio, I don't I want to name this right, WA76, which is a, I can't remember what it's called. It's, <laughs> it's a 76 clone. Um, two letters, 76. It's a it's a compressor, a hardware compressor, and that that's all on my vocals as I go in first. I've got this kind of setup, which is maybe why my voice sounds kind of already a little processed as we mm, speak right now because I'm just going through that. So, yeah, so, you're a great singer though. Like this is really really nice. No, oh, thanks, man. Like this is post a little melodyne. We all use melodyne. I've been singing for a long time. I've in the and in, in this last year, like to be a little little self congratulatory. I I definitely have got a lot better at singing, and there's some there's some stuff on the way that that sound that sound like vocally way better than anything I've ever released. This this was kind of on the middle point. EQ'd, I like I like a little extra top. Touchdown! One thing I would usually do, and the fact that that's there makes me think that this should be here, okay. is this, where you absolutely mega hype push the top end. Touchdown! Midnight! Pull back till I get it right. You get this kind of top end on even you, like... you, don't care. Yes. Touchdown! Midnight. It cuts through a lot when you Pull put it in like a mix. Till I get it right. Then it's just a gain reduction and probably a post EQ, which is like some rolled off the bottom, rolled off the top. Touchdown. Well, there is midnight. Vocals you want to be delicate with. Like if you if you screw with them too much, then they're just going to stop sounding human. Do you put a deesser on there or anything? No. This can often serve as a deesser. Ah. Touchdown. Kind of doing that. Midnight. Till I get it right I miss you Don't care So, yeah, it's the reverb that makes it sound credible More than anything else Reverb on vocals is so, so important Touchdown Midnight Again, That kind of sounds cool and dry as well I don't Till know. I get it right When you're just that talented Anything sounds good This is great I don't believe in talent When you're that skillful <laughs> Layers I've got an upper layer which is just the it's same up, right? thing, pitched up loads. <laughs> Touchdown, midnight. And then I've thrown it on the sides with another micro shift. Mm. I love that plugin. It's just like, do you want it to be stereo? If yes, micro shift. One thing I love doing is getting the lead vocal 
and putting it on a track where I can manipulate the pitch of it and then moving it to be a harmony instead of singing harmonies. Part of it's because I'm lazy and I don't want to sing it and the other part is because it sits on it and the formants all kind of line up and you get some weird phasing sometimes. Mm. Like, I miss you, don't care. And that's all it is. If I take, take that out. I miss you, don't care. It's just that one harmony. It's just following it. I miss you, don't care. Th then like to bring the intensity up on the next section, I've put a little distortion on it, pretty much, and some micro shifting on the top. Quick look, side eye. And then another dry layer, and then a dry layer to kind of bring that back. Quick look, side eye, head tilt as you go by. Look, side eye, head nice. tilt as you Bye. Yeah, and then it's just about getting that thing to work with it. Miss you, don't care. That's that's really all there is to it. Like, I try not to be... <laughs> it, it, no one will believe me when I say this, but I try not to screw with my vocals too much. I try and keep them... I try and keep at least one layer really believably dry, and plus some reverb and, and you know, just some EQs and stuff and yeah. some compression and then have everything else swamp around it. I could get rid of all the all these extra little things. Like, I love vocal layering. I think it sounds good, and yeah, so I do sure. it. There's a harmony here, like that one that was here before, which like is like it. a... A quick look, side eye, head tilt as you go by. Sounds really weird on its own, but it works in the track. Quick look, side eye, head tilt as you go by. Make your lead sound good, and then everything else will be fine, <laughs> basically. Don't layer to hide a good lead unless you have to. Tomorrow you woke up, everyone forgot about this song. Everyone forgot about it, so you're like, sweet, let's release it again. Is there anything that you personally would like to change about it before putting it back out? I'd want to sing it better. <laughs> okay, what? what? I'd want to sing it better. I would want to make the build up better. The sub is too dynamic. I think it would need, I think the lower bits need to, the, the quieter bits need to be louder. There's not a lot I would change about it. It's all a little, little finesse things that would only matter to the people that care about minor details of something. You know, maybe if I was going to release it again and I, or I was asked to or something, I would try and structure it like a pop track and I maybe do some verses and have that as an instrumental post-chorus. I mean, the only thing that, I'm, that I really love, love on this track is the sound design on the bass and this. And I'm, I'm only playing this because I really want people to hear it on its own. No, <laughs> I won't lose you. And so this is a lot of layers. No. You. These are all individual takes. No, I won't lose you. Some of them are really at you. No, I won't lose you. That was that was the only time I really wanted to show off in this little interview is I wanted to be like, check this out. <laughs> so is that kind of the same principles that you were applying before? Just like a bunch of format shifting, a bunch of vocoding, a bunch of pitch correcting? No, these are all individually sung. No. Oh no, that, those are shifting. Yeah, that's, that's really terrible. So these are all individual takes apart from maybe a couple that have been shifted. The great thing about doing big choral stuff is you can screw up and it's great. <laughs> it just adds to it. Oh, I won't lose you. And like, especially with having a, these, these lids on top, no, they just hide everything. And then you vocal on top. Yeah. Wow, so that's the whole concept is like when you do like big choir-esque type things like that, you can mess up as much as you want because that, that just adds to it, right? As long as you're not messing up in the same place on each take, yeah. Well, you got like 10 layers on top of each other and then like for this little section, this one screws up, but the rest of them hold it. That just creates a little tension. Would you like my feedback on your song? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's go. All right. Vocals pristine. Some of the best vocal. Literally, there's there's one contender for vocals that is this good, and that's Diamond Eyes. I know you are in Cabo, hanging with your brother, wishing that I was your bottle, so I could be close to your lips again. 
So I'm about you, you, you British dudes. And I love that you don't have a crazy expensive microphone, but you're making it sound just brutally amazing. The sound design was amazing. The the execution was amazing. The 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 chorus or sorry, the the, the choir esque type thing at the, the end that was really really cool. Now here's here's the other part, okay? I loved your sound design, and I have nothing bad to say about it. But I have some ideas for you. So I saw that you know you're using the reverb filter in Saren. The reverb filter, for those who don't know, is a very complex comb filter. It, it, that's a really crude explanation of it, but basically it uses a bunch of peaks, a bunch of valleys on the EQ curve to create something new, right? How often do you use the comb filter on there? Not often. When it comes to like something where you need to keep the tone, you know, like what you did here, you use the reverb filter, you kept the tone of it, you know, you could still play the melody. That 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 is that's really really good. This when you use the comb filter, the comb filter is very it's very finicky. It's very it's very you know you, you have to use it in the right way because it is sound design heavy. And those who know what we're talking about, it, it is, holy crap. You know, you do touch it and you make weird noises. And th those weird noises are for ear candy. It's for something like, you know, just to just to hype it up just a little bit, right? And so that's kind of where my, my my feedback is going right there. So so it, it all depends on your taste, on what you want to do, what you want to accomplish with the song. But in this, you know, when I was listening, I got to the job and I was like, yeah, I was vibing with it, you know? And there was a part of me that kind of called out for just like the little really intricate ear candies that kind of like pop up here and there. Maybe not, you know, not playing the blunt track it's quite blunt it doesn't yeah, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't have edits it doesn't have flying exactly changes. again that's a personal decision so i mean did you want to do that i mean how you executed it with b and pop you know kind of it is what it is is that what you wanted to do to be honest it's mostly a case of it's not really a hallmark of what i have found myself doing i think there's for me i because i come from a songwriting kind of place and, and things like that i tend to not worry about those things like even though i definitely think i can hang as a producer i i don't think that much about those small little arrangement things. I've thought about them more in the last year or so on, on recent stuff, but I don't know, like those kind of edits for me feel like adornments that I would hope I wouldn't have to need. Also, I don't want to do them because I don't find them fun. Oh, they don't, okay, they don't, okay. they don't like, it's not like when I get a good chord down, it's like, Oh, feedback. And you know, yeah, you, yeah. um, and you're suddenly feeling it back again. Like, Maybe, maybe it's just because I've never done an edit or mm. changey thing that I've ever loved enough that has made me get bitten by the bug. You know, it's not fun to you. Dude, we do music because we love it and it's fun. And if it's something that's not fun to you, Fox, if it's not fun, don't do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I'm just saying, if you ever want to try it, see if you like it, hi high five. You know, it's a really good thing. It, it leads to my kind of next-ish feedback. It's the same concept, but it's, a, it's instead of using the comb filter on the on the filter section, it's a, it's using what's called a static chorus trick. Are you familiar with who AU5 is? Now you have two identical signals in which you independently have control over their delays. Yeah, yeah, the static chorus thing. I um, I tried it on this, you know? It wasn't for me. <laughs> that's, that's the tutorial that he did. It was actually really, really good. So it can I be really good for when you open up a filter. Like, I did have it tied. Don't know if I opened the chorus earlier on or if it was on there, but um, yeah, I did I did have it opening up with the whoop, 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 you know, the, the, the obvious kind of pattern that it should yeah. or could follow. It kind of introspecting on my own production style is I tend not to make too many really detailed decisions. I mean, there's, there's detail in, in a lot of these things, but at the end of the day, this is serving that melody that it started with. Mm. And that's what I think I I care about the most. And what I aim to do is make a bass sound that is a melody. Disregard that. No, no, I get it. I mean, from a sound design point of view, there's a lot of really cool stuff I could have done with this. Like I could have had a different channel to, to, to kind of go into and change the resonances on the on the reverb filter to suddenly have a suddenly di totally different tone in, a, in another section. And I just didn't. And and it's not, it's not a case of I didn't want to or that I don't think it would work. It's just maybe I should have done something like that for a second drop and I could I can agree to that. But um I like I like how it's kind of almost a one trick pony of a track. Then that's what's important, dude. If you love the way that it is and then then that's it. This is art. There's no right or wrong. It's just whatever you feel is right. Yeah, I, I, I see that though. I see I totally see that as a as a note for feedback. I think I think that comes down more than anything else, that comes down to a thing that I wrestle with, wrestle with often, and that is I don't know really where I want to be or who I want to be in terms of is this a song that I'm writing and it's got an instrumental section and that's an important and viewed from the certain angle of a dubstep track or EDM or whatever it's that's the drop 
but for me it's a it's an instrumental chorus mm -hmm. uh, and so because of that it becomes a lot less about these sort of micro changes that are very club you know that they're, they're club oriented those things it's like you you know you're you're listening to a track and then suddenly a cool edit happens in the track's like whoa and then it reinvigorates you and i i, I see that as a useful tool but where i come from it, 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 i i ended up doing dance music and drop music as a necessity more than more than a goal so you're more so doing that just to to really uh, give a bass b-a-s-e for your vocals to sit on right to, to kind of like enhance them is that what you're saying i guess so i mean i i and this is the thing is as, as, as soon as i start saying something like this i'm like no i like making i like producing i like <laughs> i like sound design i like making a heavy mix down and yeah it's it's weird it's weird i go back and forth daily on on how i feel about those sorts of things and you can tell which kind of day a track was made on by its structuring <laughs> you touched on a really important thing you know when it comes to art, when it comes to this kind of stuff, some days you feel like making dubstepy kind of stuff, some days you want to, you're more keen towards your your songwriter side. That's okay. On a business standpoint, on an artistic standpoint, like that's all good. I mean, yeah, with a business standpoint, you kind of have to shave the sides a little bit, make it, you know, make it, you know, it's under a brand, so it has to fit within a certain box kind of a thing. But that's not to say you can't have another brand. That's not to say you can't just make it just for fun. That's not to say, hey, screw the brand. I just want to do what I want to do. You know what I mean? Like that, that's all decisions that you need to make up. But at the end of the day, dude, you just do what you want to do, man. When Absolutely, I, man. When you were talking about this, you were excited. You were happy about it. That's what I want to see from your tracks, man. When you're done, and if you're happy about it, that's that's what matters. Yeah, man. One thing, one thing I will say. I guess it's kind of counter to a lot of the stuff we talked about today, and like these small details. My newest stuff is so simple now. My, I've got a track I was working on. The drops literally like kick, hi hat, snare a beefed up saw that has a bit of engineering craziness going on right. and then a really echoey lead and that's that's the drop and it still goes i've been playing it out what i will say to a lot of people is it's better to do something that's convincing than something that's con complex that's that's beautiful any fool can be complicated it takes a genius to be simple <laughs> that's not me that's woody guthrie that's not me i'm really happy with where it went i'm glad that it's getting the attention it's getting i'm glad that there's so many people playing it out it excites me that i'm able to bring melody Back to, I mean, there, there was there was a track on that EP that that was that felt a little bit not not very me, and that's fine. It was fun to make anyway. I think that this this track more than anything else has given me confidence to kind of say screw it to this whole really heavy dubstep movement that's coming through and being like, you guys have fun. I'm gonna do some melodies. The feedback on this track has given me a little bit more faith in, especially my American centric output. I highly respect you for that man Thank you're seeing you a trend much, you're man. seeing something that's going on but you're like you know what if i went down that road maybe i'd make more money maybe i get some connections yeah, maybe maybe but i wouldn't be staying true to myself and i wouldn't be making what i want to make and so i'm proud of you dude if you keep that success is this is inevitable your future is made <laughs> <Thank> you, <man. laughs> Fox. i mean I'm, I'm happy i'm i'm having fun i've i've done a lot of stuff that i've wanted to do in the last year um now now i'm just chilling i'm making tracks for the sake of making tracks again that's and uh great. i'm sure something cool will happen do you have a good time yeah i had a great time it was really fun that's awesome final 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 question who would you like to see come on in the doll? Great. They do some cool stuff. Yep. In terms of engineering, I know they're very, very good. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks, man. I'll, I'll catch you next time.